and welcome. I'm Denise Bisayon from the Graduate Programs in Public Health, who are very, very excited about today's uh, presentation by Dr. Smith uh, for IPEC. And I want to give the floor to Dr. Dora Ann Mills to introduce um, Dr. Smith, because they work so closely together for so many years that um, she doesn't even have to have this bio sketch. <laughs> so Dr. Uh, Mills. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for coming. I know that this week is a very intense one with uh, exams soon following, and so I know many people are very, students especially, are uh, needing to study and, and pay their attention to that. But we so appreciate those of you who could show up today. Um, it's really a great pleasure and great honor to have Dr. Andy Smith here with us. Uh, as Denise mentioned, Andy and I go back a, a few, quite a few years actually, I think about 20 now. But we were, um, but he's, I should mention, Andy is a, a native of Reedfield, Maine, so which is a small town outside of Augusta, and graduated from high school from there, and then went to University of Maine, Orono, and actually spent several years doing oceanography research at the Bigelow Laboratories here in Maine. And as part of that, got to fly to the Antarctic and other exotic places to do oceanography research. And then he um, worked at NRCM, the National Natural Resources Council of Maine, which is a major, the major private environmental advocacy group in the state of Maine. And worked under um, Brownie Carson, who is a very famous environmental advocate um, here in Maine, or just retired a few months ago as being executive director there. And then when I met him, he was um, getting his uh, doctorate from Harvard School of Public Health in toxicology. And we met because we were both from Maine, and his wife is a, a pediatrician um, who was practicing down there in, in Boston at the time. So we had an, um, several conversations um, at Harvard. And then one time over lunch, I think it was, he said he was going to be working at the Bureau of Health, um, which is now called the Maine CDC, and he'd just been hired as a toxicologist. And I said, well, I just got hired as the director of the Bureau of Health. <laughs> so, so we actually started work together on the same day at the Bureau of Health on September 1st, 1996. Not that I remember the day, but it was, uh, it was easy to remember. So we started the same time, and, the, uh, and we worked very closely together. We had, um, I, my, uh, and I, I, I'm going to embarrass them probably a little bit, but I honestly can say, and this is just not an exaggeration, that I don't know um, of anybody, um, I, ca I can't think of anybody anyway very easily who um, has a more intelligent mind than Andy Smith. He is an incredible thinker. And I know when I would get stuck with some <laughs> issue having to figure out, and sometimes these issues came up at odd hours of the day or at night, even if it was an issue not having to do with toxicology um, or environmental health, I would often call on Andy to say, can I just run this issue by you? And see, can you help me think about this? So, and I think we've done that with each other a lot over the years, is just to help me think about this. Um, and, but he, his expertise came, it was invaluable in many environmental issues in Maine including um, arsenic poisoning in New Sweden, including mercury, a big mercury spill in Waterville, Maine a few years ago. Some kids got into some mercury. Um, and including figuring out fish advisories. I think that was the first thing, one of the first things we worked on was we were tasked with um, advising the public on fish, uh, how much fish to eat in Maine. And I mean, honestly, I had no idea about this topic at all. So I was uh, extremely grateful to have Andy's help on that. And actually, Andy did all the work on it, but his advice on that and, and, and guidance on that. And, and then um, on, on many, many issues, environmental issues that really ran the gamut, lead poisoning, for instance, um, and even now more met asthma and many other environmental health issues. One of the things that uh, really came to our attention was in January of 1998, when some of you were living in Maine might remember we had a major uh, ice storm, and we had an outbreak of carbon monoxide poisoning. And it was really one of the first big times I remember dealing with carbon monoxide. And Andy really took the reins to have, help us to fully address this as an emergency at that time but also to use that incident 
as a way of studying and figuring out how we could address carbon monoxide in a more robust way in Maine. And he has really become known as a leader in this issue um, across the country. So I'm very excited that he is here to talk to us about carbon monoxide, something that we know, um, as you can see, uh, can't smell, can't see, can't taste, can't taste it, but we're learning more and more about its impact on our lives. So thank you so much for driving down from Augusta and being with us today, Andy, and um, look forward to hearing you. Thanks. Well, thank you. It's a little like a home, uh, old home week here because there's so many faces that I recognize and have had a lot of interactions over the year, including Sue Stableford, who sort of pointed out to me that toxicologists don't know how to communicate to the general public. And uh, <laughs> so we had years of her trying to beat some sense into our heads to, to learn how to do this effectively. Um, but um, and do I, for the gentleman way up, do I just point this here? Great, so technologically challenged. So what I'm going to do over the next so 30, 40 minutes is um, tell several stories. And it's really about the way carbon monoxide poisoning sort of presented itself to us. So we'll start with this sort of major outbreak associated with the severe weather um, uh, incident of the ice storm, how we sort of respond to that, then did a study and what we learned about it as sort of a public health issue and how to respond to them in the future. Then I'll stop in the midway um, and then talk a little bit about carbon monoxide toxicity. What do we know about it? How does it do its thing? Why are we concerned about it? How do you test for it? What's a little bit about the clinical management of it with a big caveat that I'm not a clinician, but I'll tell you what I know. Um, and then I'll step back and talk about it a little bit more generally as a public health issue um, because we see CO poisoning year round. And so what are some of the risk factors, and how do we know that, and how do we respond to it? Um, and I'll end with sort of what are we doing to try to prevent it, and talk a little bit about the new law that requires carbon monoxide detectors in certain homes, what that law is, and what do we know about how effective that law is being. So hopefully I'll have time to do all that um, as I move, move around. But uh, to just begin with, um, um, you know, this is one of the most common causes of accidental poisoning uh, in the country. Uh, four to 500 deaths a year, over 20,000 emergency department visits. Um, and it is preventable, which is the important thing. So, um, so it's an important issue to be aware of. Um, but let's start back, um, for any of you that were in the state, this is a familiar figure, with 1998, January 7th through the 9th, a three-day ice storm. Um, and by the time it was done, we had half the state of Maine without power. And some of those families were going to be without power for up to three weeks. Um, and then once the ice storm ended, it went cold, quite cold. Um, and so now you have families that are concerned about how am I going to heat the house? How am I going to pre pre um, prevent pipes from freezing and bursting? What am I going to do about all this money I have wrapped up in food in my freezer? And what about things in the refrigerator? What am I going to use for water? and get most of us, half the states, on private wells. So how am I going to get the water out of the well into the house? This isn't like a one-day thing where I can just have a bunch of jugs sitting that I'll use for the flush. I'm in this for the long haul. Um, and it's Maine. So Maine, we're a self-reliant, hardy population. So for some of us who are heating with wood, well, at least we didn't have to worry about heat that much, right? And maybe we could even cook on it. So we had some options. Our biggest issue was electricity. Um, and then there would be other people who would say, well, I've got this kerosene heater. I know it's someplace in the barn or the attic, so I'll go and get that, and I'll bring that out. And maybe it hasn't been used in a long time. It hasn't been maintained. The wick might not be at the right height, and it may not be as efficient as you would hope it would be. And then there are the portable generators, which around that time were becoming you know, more economical for people to own. You might have the small number that actually have one professionally installed, either in the garage that comes on automatically and vents out. But many people were using portable generators of different sizes. And they would either have the plug running someplace in the house to go to a refrigerator or freezer. Or if they were clever or not wise, um, they might try to hot wire it to their furnace to run their furnace. Or they might use it to run um, right to the panel. Or you may have paid an electrician to actually put in a transfer box 
and it plugs in nicely there, and you flick the switch so that you don't fry the linemen who are working out there, and you can power everything through your fuse box, and now it's just a question of how much, how big the generator is and how much power you can get. But almost immediately after the lights went out, we started to see increases in carbon monoxide poisoning um, appearing. And so in this figure, you can see, let's see if I can make this work. Um, this is sort of keeping track of number of households without power, daily counts of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning cases at emergency departments. We had no surveillance system for carbon monoxide poisoning at this time. It was not a notifiable disease. We had no syndromic surveillance system. We knew nothing about this. It was a astute EMT who happened to be out on his third run of the night bringing people into the hospital for carbon monoxide poisoning who called a friend who happened to be a public health physician and said, hey, I think we have an outbreak of CO poisoning. And the public health physician tried over the weekend to reach us, because our power was out and our phone was out, to say, I think we have something going on. And by the time, Doro, remember, we struggled into the office on Monday, we knew we had an issue, but we didn't know anything about it. And so our surveillance system at that time was to start to call the EDs daily and say, can you tell us how many cases of carbon monoxide poisoning you've seen? And that's how we learned about it. And then we had to quickly come up to speed and decide, well, what's causing this? Can you tell us what they're telling you when they come into the emergency departments? And we had some ED docs that were just wonderful working with us. They became the spokespeople on television. Um, they were the ones helping us get the messages out that we were giving them to help get out. Um, and that was our surveillance system at that time for carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, we, of course, used this after to say we ought to do a study of this. Because this wasn't the first one to happen. There were some reports elsewhere in the literature. Um, they have now seen these associated with ice storms, winter storms, tornadoes, hurricanes, and floods. Um, and so the question was, can we learn from there? Because people have reported it, but n very few people had actually done a formal study. So we decided we would do a case control study. So we had our cases. And this is some information about some of the cases we got from pulling records from the emergency departments to try to figure out what the source of exposure was. And then we did 500 random, select random selected controls that we then asked what the risk factors were. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But here you can see you know, what was the big risk factor and it was generators. And you might think, why generators? Well, generators make a lot of carbon monoxide. They actually make a single generator has the amount of carbon monoxide associated with 100 vehicles. And so clearly, you wouldn't want 100 vehicles parked in your garage, left running. You probably wouldn't want 100 cars sitting outside your bedroom window slightly ajar because there's a cord coming through it running. Um, and so there's a real hazard um, in terms of how much they can produce, how quickly they can produce, and how it can become uh, very, very dangerous. Um, so what were people doing with these generators? Well, when we did surveys, surprisingly, whoops, I'll go backwards. Now what have I done? Oh, there we go. Surprisingly, 30% of the people in the controls actually had used a generator. So you can use a generator safely, but you know there were some poisonings associated with people using them outside the home. But if you use that as your reference group and compare that to people using in an attached structure, you have about a 20-fold higher odds of getting carbon monoxide poisoning if you're operating a generator in an attached structure like a garage, even with the door open. If you're operating it in the basement, about a 300-fold high risk. So, Obviously, you don't want to operate in the basement, and we didn't have enough, but anyone who operated in a living area was poisoned. Um, we had a death. Um, in the end, 275 poisonings associated with this one sort of three-week period of carbon monoxide poisoning associated with this incident. Um, so that then raises the question, well, where should you put a generator? And this was a national issue. Um, if you go to the south after a hurricane, when they happen, it's not the heater they're trying to get going, it's the air conditioning they try to get going. Air conditioners draw in a lot of air. So the question is, where do you place the generator to make sure you're not drawing in a lot of CO poisoning? 
So the CDC contracted with the National Institute for Standards and Technology, I believe is what NIST stands for, to undertake a simulation modeling study to try to figure out where you should place a generator. Um, and their recommendation was more than 15 feet away from the home um, in order to make sure that you don't have it coming into the house. And how did they do this? Well, they did all these sort of various simulation studies where they would model the generator being at different locations from the house when the wind's blowing directly at the house and the window's slightly ajar because you've got a cord going into the house. So that's their high risk situation. And then they would do the same thing on the other side of the house because as the wind blows, you get a reentrainment effect. And that was their basis for recommending that it ought to be more than 15 feet. And that's the recommendation of CDC now to say it should be 20 to 25 feet. Now think about Sue trying to get people to do this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so if you look at the manuals for generators, they will say things like, use with as short a car cord as possible, because you may overload the cord. And so they're recommending a cord less than 15 feet. Well, if you're trying to get it 15 feet away from the house, and you have, you're recommending um, if you're recommending it be more than 15 feet away from the house and the manual is telling you to use the shorter cord, we've already got a conflict there. And then you have a problem with you're asking people to sort of do a risk risk decision about getting electrocuted versus getting poisoned. Because if you also look at the warnings on the generator, in addition to telling you always use it outside, never use it within a garage, is what the newer ones say, but they also say never use it in wet conditions to avoid getting electrocuted. And most people know what a shock is like, and they don't want to do that. Um, they're less sure what this carbon monoxide poisoning thing is about. So they're having to judge. So if it's powers out, the house is dark, it's raining outside, or it's icing, well, that garage with the door open looks like adequate ventilation to them. And so I think that's one of the communication issues we're struggling with and trying to get people to think about how they ought to place a generator. So now let's ask, what do people do? You know, we're out there putting our warnings out, telling people to operate in 15 feet. So a public health physician who remained nameless decided after a uh, power outage in which a large part of her community was out power, and she could hear these n noises of motors humming throughout her neighborhood, thought she would just drive around and take pictures of what her neighbors were doing with um, their generator. So clearly not 15 feet away from the window. Clearly not 15 feet away from the door. Clearly not being used with adequate ventilation um, located within the garage. That's not bad. So the cord's going to a receptacle. That probably means they have a transfer box right there. Nothing's open. It's not 15 feet, but that's not bad. And believe it or not, there was one doing it the way they're supposed to be doing, which is well away from the house. So um, we have and continue to have a communication issue with this. If you look at Tropical Storm Irene, we had four different incidents, two deaths with one incident, generator located in the basement, professionally installed, installed to have exhaust going out. Nobody checked to maintain. The exhaust was plugged. The house filled with CO. We had another one operating in a barn attached to the house. In an open area, the wind blew the barn door shut concentrations build up inside. And then we had two cases where it was located, like the first picture I showed you, too close to a window. And then as you had the airflow in, it would be. It's a little bit like Russian roulette, because if the air is directly perpendicular to the house, you have a high risk, or low wind, you have a high risk. But if the wind's blowing at more of an angle, the risk is lower. So when you place your generator, unless you're testing the wind direction, you're basically playing a little bit of a Russian roulette. Um, with whether or not you might get CO poisoning. So now, with that as sort of the intro piece, let's step back for a moment and talk a little bit about carbon monoxide. It's a small molecule, two atoms, just carbon and oxygen. Um, you've already heard Dora say it's color, odorless, colors, tasteless, and non-irritating. And why is that important? That's important because it means all of our usual sensors for knowing we're in a hazardous situation aren't going to help us. So you're not going to know you're being exposed most likely until it's too late. That's why alarms are so important to have in your house. And it's a product of incomplete combustion. So any sort of combustion source that's other than 100% efficient, which is most of them, 
is going to have some degree of risk of emitting carbon monoxide. And then if you're using it in an enclosed environment where it can build up, then you've got a problem. So <clears throat> for the, those of you who remember your biology, um, let's first talk about the way things are supposed to work. So we have hemoglobin, that metalloprotein molecule in our red blood cells that's capable of binding oxygen, and then as it gets transported into areas of low oxygen, it's released into our tissue. So that's the way it's supposed to work. So, oops, go back one. And it has this um, heme molecule in it. That's where the oxygen actually binds right to that little iron group. Um, and that heme is in hemoglobin. It's also in a number of other metalloproteins, such as myoglobin, which is in your muscle, especially the cardiac muscle, cytochrome C in your electron transport system, so in your mitochondria, your big energy factories. So there's a number of ways in which um, oxygen um, is delivered to tissues and used in various redox re creations, uh, reactions. Um, that's important here. So that's the way it's supposed to work, right? So you pick up oxygen in the lungs, you deliver it into the tissues, and the problem with carbon monoxide is it binds to the same site on the hemoglobin molecule, on the myoglobin molecule, and on the cytochrome. And it binds with affinity about 200 times greater than that of oxygen. And then once it's bound, it doesn't release that easily. So basically what you have happening is hypoxia. So you've interfered with the delivery of oxygen to the tissues. And so those tissues that need a lot of oxygen, the brain, the heart, are particularly vulnerable in the fetus, obviously, are particularly vulnerable to carbon monoxide. Um, what we typically measure, or you typically measure in the clinical setting, is carboxyhemoglobin. So there's the amount of that carbon monoxide that's bound hemoglobin, percent carbon, uh, carboxyhemoglobin. Uh, it can either be done by getting a, a sample and doing blood gases, or more often what you're seeing, especially in the field, is one of these CO oximeters. Um, that you can actually put on the finger and get a measurement that way. Very useful in sort of a triage. For a typical person who's a non-smoker, you're going to have about 2% carboxyhemoglobin in your body um, circulating because it also is a part of normal metabolism to produce a little bit of carbon monoxide. Um, but if you're a smoker, uh, you could have up to 10%. Um, so obviously when we're doing any sort of evaluation of someone who's been exposed to carbon monoxide, we need to know whether they're a smoker or they're not a smoker. Um, and this is just showing you the relationship between carboxyhemoglobin levels and concentrations in the air. And if you see this line, I've drawn at about 10% um, carboxyhemoglobin. That is what most detectors are trying to deal with. So carbon monoxide detectors work both in terms of what the concentration is and how long. So they're set to alarm so that if you're exposed to a lower concentration for a longer period of time, they'll go off. High concentration, shorter period of time and that's to avoid some false positives. Um, but it's basically sort of taking care of this relationship. But one of the points I want to make here is you could become poisoned after a relatively short period of time in just minutes if the concentrations are very high. And we have measured, fire departments will go in with gas meters, and we've measured in some of the places where we've had poisonings and generators, concentrations as high as 1,000 to 500 ppm in rooms where, um, or an attached garage or a house where a generator is operating. So you can get some very high concentrations, which is why you also have to be very careful. If you find someone who's a poisoning victim, right, you're there, you show up at the garage, you see someone inside, there's a generator running, and you want to go in and help, that could be a very, very dangerous thing to do So, um, if the concentrations are very high there. Um, and um, this is just showing the sort of symptoms that are associated with carbon monoxide for different concentration ranges, different exposure levels. A lot of information in this slide, but just to give you a sense, again, that if the concentrations are very high, you can get death within just a couple of minutes to half an hour, an hour. So if this occurs at night and you don't have an alarm, you can see why this can be such a tragic thing um, for people. Um, and these are the most common symptoms that are presented in the emergency departments when you have um, cases of more mild, by far the most common symptom is headache. Headache, nausea, dizziness, fatigue, vomiting, pretty non-descriptive symptoms could be a lot of different things. In the winter, it can sometimes get confused with the flu, um, except you don't have the fever. Um, and so there is some element of risk of actually missing carbon monoxide cases that are out there because the symptoms themselves are so non-descript or non-specific. 
Um, and then there is a perception among some that if you don't die from carbon monoxide poisoning and you get your supplemental oxygen, everything is fine. And I'd like to sort of get you to think differently about that if you are thinking that, because about 50% of the survivors may have neurological complications. Um, and they may be immediate and therefore obvious, or they may be delayed from anywhere from two to three weeks. And this is an emerging area of study, and the list of symptoms associated with neuro the neurological symptoms seems to keep growing. So there's those that are more sort of motor related, um, and then there are those that are more cognitive and psychologically related. Um, and the current recommendation is that anyone coming in for evaluation of carbon monoxide poisoning should get some sort of mental exam as well. The most typical treatment is going to be oxygen therapy. Um, and I'll be careful here because I'm not a cl clinician. But basically what you're trying to do is speed the replacement of oxygen on hemoglobin and speed getting oxygen to tissues. Um, the, my understanding is the whole issue of hyperbaric chambers remains a controversial one in terms of when to do it and when it's best to do it and how successful it is in, for example, avoiding neurological sequelae. Um, but for a typical person left at room, it's going to take about two to three hours to reduce carboxyhemoglobin levels about by half. You put them on 100% oxygen, you'll lower that to you know, more like an hour or two. And if you put them in a hyperbaric chamber, you can lower it to 15 to 20 minutes. So that's really the benefits of doing that, is to speed the replacement of, of um, getting rid of the carbon monoxide and replacing it with oxygen. So now let's switch to the sort of more public health broader sense. So we've done our severe weather event. We've talked a little bit about the toxicology of carbon monoxide. So now let's go back to the, the bigger picture, which was really what we started to wonder after this incident, which was, well, now that we understand the severe weather, just how common this is. And again, at the time, we did not have any sort of surveillance system to get information on this. So we looked back in time and got access to hospital billing administrative data and tried to count the sort of cases that are out there and better understand what those numbers are. And I'll talk a bit about that. But first, just keep in mind that there are many sources of carbon monoxide in your home. So there's obviously the car if you leave it running in the barn. If you decide to get your charcoal grill going um, in the barn that, or in the garage, that's going to be a problem running a kerosene heater. If you have gas appliances, all those are sources, especially if you don't well maintain them. If there's any problem with the exhaust, um, that's just why it's good to have those serviced every year. That's going to be a risk. If you have a <laughs> furnace, um, that's a source. Again, if not well maintained and if there's any problem with the flue or the chimney, same with a fireplace or a gas stove all variety of sources within the home, which is why it's important to have carbon monoxide detector. This is what the data currently look like for carbon monoxide poisoning in Maine. This is the overall sort of counts that we see of people showing up in the emergency department having confirmed levels of non-intentional, non-fire related carbon monoxide poisoning. And there's not a big difference, you know, at least in recent years for male versus female. The other thing we can ask is, well, do they occur more than one season than the other? No big surprise that what you'll see is they tend to occur more in the winter months than in the other times of the year. We have most of our heating during the winter months. So and since most of them seem to be related to furnaces, that's not a big surprise. Um, we can ask, are there spatial differences within the state? Are there some counties or we're now using public health districts? Most public health districts are just a combination of two or more counties. Uh, Western Maine, for whatever reason, which we're still starting to research and understand, seems to have a much higher rate of carbon monoxide poisoning than almost any other public health district. Um, so that's Enniscoggin County and Franklin and, o and Oxford um, as well. So um, that we're still trying to understand, and it looks to be more Franklin, Oxford than Enniscoggin um, as to why that is. Um, and so then what we decided was, well, we've milked that data for all we can get of looking at these hospital records. So it helps us understand spatial, temporal features of carbon monoxide poisoning in the state and overall rates of male versus female. We can look at it as a function of income. And what we see is you lower the income, the more likely you're going to get carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and we can look at it workers versus non-workers somewhat. And we see maybe about 20% of cases are work-related. 
and we can look at what the risk factors for those. Um, but still, there's only so much you can do from that sort of data. So we decided we would make copper monoxide poisoning a notifiable condition. So that now means every time there's a case at an emergency department or in a hospital, it gets reported to us. Every one of those cases that looks like a, a um, something with a carboxyhemoglobin level above 5% and is not a smoker, we are calling the case and doing interviews to collect information to help better identify the risk factors so we can then better target our interventions. And so what have we learned from doing that? Well, um, this just shows you the amount of counts that we've gotten over just, this is just a little less than a two-year period where we've now got the data fully analyzed. Um, so you see we're handling about 521 case reports coming in that we have to go through and figure out how many of those clearly are confirmed or probable cases of CO poisoning, um, that there's no doubt how many are suspect and how many are just exposure cases but no clinical symptoms at all and we don't think there's any sort of poisoning versus no case. So that's sort of the work we have to do on our end uh, to review each one of those cases and make that call. And then part of it is because we want to understand what the major risk factors are. Um, and you can see primary one of the biggest, this, this is just a big catch-all category, but furnaces, generators, cars running, and forklifts are among some of the biggest risk factors. Forklifts are going to be work-related, so operating a forklift within an enclosed environment like a blueberry uh, packing place or an apple packing place or in a paper mill where they're moving big rolls of paper around. Those have all been associated. Usually it's a poorly maintained or they're using a gasoline-powered forklift when they really should be using a propane-powered forklift within these environments have been associated with the work ones. Um, and there have been some surprises. Um, so for example, we got a flurry of poisonings one year that were all associated with people opening their summer camps. And so they were coming to their summer camps and they were getting that gas-powered refrigerator or um, shower working, water heater working, um, and they didn't bother to check to see if any animals had plugged up the flu. Um, and so we had some poisonings, and so we issued warnings for that. And interestingly, we've not seen any sense. So whether that was a coincidence or our great work, Sue, um, <laughs> at, uh, and great communication, so it's, it's hard to know. So, and this is just an example of how you use this sort of detailed surveillance information to let you target your outreach efforts in a very specific way at a very specific time, which you can't do if you don't have this sort of information. Um, and now we get to what else can we do besides getting these messages, and uh, Senator Diamond decided he would propose legislation to make carbon monoxide detectors a requirement in certain homes. And I think this makes Maine one of I could be wrong on this. I think in some ways around 20 states have variations of different laws. Um, I'm proud to say ours is probably one of the most extensive. Um, so in our state now, every rental unit has to have a carbon monoxide detector. Every new home being built has to have carbon monoxide detectors. Every existing home, and this is what's different, when there's a housing transaction, there's a paper that has to be signed indicating the buyer will put in carbon monoxide detectors. In any home when there is a major renovation, a code enforcement officer has to check and try to make sure there's a carbon monoxide detector. So that, you know, and the requirement is a carbon monoxide detector that has both electrical service and battery backup. Um, so when the power goes out, you still have a functioning carbon monoxide detector. And the question is, so have we made any gains? given that we have this new law. And if you look across the various counties from 2004 to 2010, we've had a pretty dramatic increase in the prevalence of carbon monoxide detectors in the state, which is really quite a nice achievement. We've gone from the 30s to you know, generally 50s, almost 60% of homes now have a carbon monoxide detector in just a few years, which you know, in the public health world is always pretty amazing when you get that sort of break. And what is even more interesting to do is look at it for rentals. Um, so in the, in the rental properties, we've gone from, look at Western District, 29% to 59% in one year. In one year. Because the law went into effect. 2009 was the first year we asked a question about rental. The law goes into effect during that year. In 2010, we just asked again. And we've gone dramatic increase in rental. And you know what? 
was accomplished by doing that. If you now look at the socioeconomic um, um, descriptors of our CO patient population, the differences are gone. So we used to have a really dramatic income-related risk of CO poisoning. It is much less as a result of this change. So that's really good news. But it will take us another year or two before we have enough data to sort of really evaluate, is this causing a decrease in carbon monoxide morbidity and mortality, which is what we really wanted to do. It is secondary prevention. So this is not primary prevention, right? You're still going to have the source if you're not addressing the source. It's still going to result potentially in some CO poisoning. So the other thing we'll be looking at is when people do go to the ED now, is on average the carboxyhemoglobin level lower than what they were before we had all these detectors out there. So we've not really prevented CO poisoning completely. All we've done is the odds are it's not going to be anywhere near as severe as what it was. Um, and we have a bunch of things we're doing to try to get the message out. We have PSAs, Health Alert Network. These are the sort of things we activate during health emergencies. We do press releases, the same sort of thing that most public health pro pro projects do. But I will tell you it's a real challenge when there's a major storm coming to get your word out because there's a lot of news and a lot of the news is about interest stories and other things. So to try to get a message about CO poisoning in advance of a major storm has really proved to be difficult. Once we have some bodies, we have no problem getting messages. <laughs> but until we get bodies, it is really hard to break through the noise and all the other messages that are, that are out there. Um, and that's sort of a challenge. And that's it. So I'll be glad to take any questions or... Done? So, thanks. The question was, is there an effective way, and you can tell me if I get this right. So the question was, is there an effective way to test and know if your carbon monoxide detector is working? Um, some of the detectors will actually have a button you press on them to see if they're working. Um, you can actually buy um, a, um, it's a little bottle that will actually release a little bit of something that will cause a detector to go off that you can check and make sure it's working. But that's it. The recommendation is that you replace these every three to five years because the sensors only have a certain life. So, and if there's anyone else who knows a better answer to that, then. Uh, the current recommendation um, is that you have one outside every major sleeping area of the home. So if you have a home like mine, and so I have a basement level cover, uh, bedroom, the daughter wants to be as far away as possible. I have the upper level where the parents and Toby still sleeps probably for another couple of years before he demands to go to the dungeon. So in that case, we have one on each of those levels. Um, you can put one, say, outside the furnace room, um, but the thing to remember is what's really important is that you can hear it when it goes off, especially if you're asleep. So that's why there's a general recommendation that it's always outside every major sleeping area. So if you have a cluster of bedrooms on one floor, you can have one in the hallway out there, and that will usually be enough. The question was, should you have a carbon monoxide, or really, it's, should you have a carbon monoxide detector placed in the room? I'm trying to decide where. So if the generator's outside the house, you've got a window slightly open. Right? You've got a cord coming in, and you're worried about carbon monoxide getting into the house. Sure, you could have it in that room where the window's slightly ajar. But you'd be, the first thing you should do is make sure it's 15 feet away from the house. So, and then you probably don't have an issue. Way over there? I don't think there's any requirements. I don't know, Dora, if you know. I don't think there's any requirements for carbon monoxide detectors beyond those that are in state law. So. For example, there was a recent question about whether university dorms should have carbon monoxide detectors, which uh, the legislature decided it would not take on at this time, given the cost associated with it and the implications. But um, there's, uh, but I'm not aware. You know, in our office building, there are no carbon monoxide detectors, um, even though they were doing construction work outside and had a generator. Outside, so uh, so um, um, so. Other than the residential, um, it would only be if, for insurance reasons, there was a requirement to have carbon monoxide detectors. But I'm not aware of of um, anything else. You know, we've had a number of poisonings over the past few years with hotels 
in some very unusual situations because of the location of the vents. Just happened to they get a weird wind situation they've drawn in. That's been associated with several high profile poisonings. The law does apply to them. So um, here, uh, way in the back, waiting with the microphone, and then. What kind of um, warnings are put on to um, generators and furnaces and others known to cause, you know, to put out carbon monoxide? And what are those corporations and companies doing to uh, promote um, the detectors? Uh, well, I can't, I can't speak to what the companies are doing to promote detectors in any way. Um, but, but there are several parts there. Um, if you look at this, the sort of newly sold generators, they will now have both a, a visual image as well as words. The visual images show, you know, don't have it in the house. So there's a little house with a generator inside with a big no through it. And then they'll show you a garage with obviously a car parked into it and the generator next to it and a big no as well with warnings on it. So that's the new generators. If you have an older generator like mine, it just says use with adequate ventilation. Is, you know, and, and remember, I showed you earlier that when we did the survey in 1998, 30% of the people who responded to the survey said they had used a generator. So there are a lot of these out there now. Um, and so as far as promoting detectors, um, I'm not aware. We've tried to do some outreach with box stores to try to say, if you're selling generators, how about you co-locate the detectors with them? That hasn't gone over very well. Um, so I think they're concerned about any sort of implied uh, responsibility, liability, would be my, my guess. Um, what the Consumer Product Safety Commission is really focused on, because um, there's been some discussions about, should you have some sort of detector or kill switch on the generator itself? Um, but there's the, And that sounds initially like, what a great idea. But then as you start to think about it, it's really problematic. These things have a lot of vibration. And the question is, how reliable would the sensor be? And would you give people a false sense of safety? And it's not a proven technology. So what the Consumer Product Safety Commission is really focused on is developing a new sort of generation of generators um, that are low CO admitting. Um, just like we went from the two cycle chainsaws to the four cycle chainsaws that have a lot less CO. Um, and they're sort of testing some of those now, and I think that's the direction you'll see. But again, that's going to be the new ones, and you know, we know how the sort of wood stove replacement program has gone. It's taken generations and generations to get rid of wood stoves, so um, it could take a long time to replace the stock of generators we have now. Question right here? Yeah, given the amount of private homes that aren't required to have this in it, is there any sort of rebate system in the state of Maine, given the socioeconomic status of a lot of the people, that would allow people to um, be able to get some of these free? I'm seeing that they're about $25, $26 a piece, and you know, five or six in your home is going to cost them quite a bit of money. The answer is no. So, I mean, it's, it'd be great, but um, no, there's been no talk of any sort of rebate program or funding. I mean, I think everyone's aware of the current climate around government programs and, and you know, those sort of things. So it'd be a hard sell, you know. You, again, with the, the really the big thing there is what's happened in the rental market. Because, you know, people with limited income often end up in rental situations instead of owning their own home. And the law is very specific there. They have to have them. And we were really quite pleased to see how fast the law is being implemented. So I think that's a huge issue for that population. Right. Question there? Um, I was just wondering if there's any workers' compensation benefits for people who are exposed. At oh, I think there's probably employment. people in the room who may know that better than I do. So, um, so actually, I don't. I would imagine there's, but I don't. I don't. I don't know the answer to that. So. Um, The chronic. Yeah. I remember being in the main med emergency room for a while working, and um, there was a woman who had a really tiny, tiny office that was right adjacent to where the um, ambulances <laughs> idled. And she did, around the time I left, she had missed several weeks of work. Hmm. And I, I 
it was years ago, but I think she was in some sort of battle trying to, she couldn't come back to work yet. And yeah. she had worked there for years. So I don't yeah. know enough about yeah. it, but it yeah. just made me wonder yeah. if that was an incentive maybe for institutions to, you know, if they knew they might have to <laughs> compensate someone, if maybe that would be an incentive. Yeah, the, the problem have. is going to be, um, you know, what sort of record would you have to indicate what it is? So, for example, we're doing a consultation with someone at, um, uh, down at, down at, um, Harvard Medical School who's seeing a, a worker who had to do some work in cleaning a uh, ash pit for a, um, a boiler and they were down there welding without any protective gear and the alarm is going off and the person comes out vomiting and a severe headache all the classic symptoms of CO poisoning but you know no one got them to see anyone so there's no carboxyhemoglobin, there's no ED visit, there's no evidence. It has all this. And now they have a lot of neurological symptoms that are consistent with carbon monoxide poisoning. But how do you ever link it back? Because there's no data or information there to make that case. I've got a quick question going back to basic science. Um, and uh, it has to do with... Uh, plant metabolism of carbon dioxide. And you're expecting me to <laughs> No, but I wondered, um, do plants metabolize yeah. carbon monoxide as well? And if so, what about having, you know, in, in places like that little office, I don't know if um, it would uh, take care of the, that CO2 level enough to keep the person from getting headaches yeah, every day. Yeah. Well, clearly a gardener um, who's asking the question, I, I know that, so that's why I can. <laughs> um, I I don't I I don't have a clue. So, yeah, yeah. Um. Uh, just to to try to maybe help with that question on workers' comp. Um, workers' comp is a hard time with chronic illness, as you as you know. Uh, workers' comp does a great job when 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 a block of wood falls on your foot and you injure your foot. That's the incident occurs, there's mm -hmm. a way of timing it, and the injury is well known, so on and so forth. But when it's a chronic injury, a chronic illness, when did it start, what were the incidents, and all that, it's very difficult. So workers' comp has a hard time mm -hmm. with any kind of chronic illness. It's, it's been a real issue. Mm -hmm. Even occupational asthma is right. one that's not even covered by workers' comp or they're thinking about it. So it's a difficult issue for workers' comp. And even if the um, chronic um, illness, let's say, is clearly associated with an acute incident, it still becomes a problem with workers' comp? Or if it's clearly associated with a acute incident, how does workers' comp deal with it then? So I, right, so that would be, and so still, I don't know the answer to your, to your question. I do know someone to ask, though. So Dr. Leslie Wally is an occupational health doc in our office um, that we're very fortunate to have. Um, yeah, so Leslie would know the question for that. So if you want to get the answer, I can get it for you. So, yeah. And I was going to ask Mills. you a couple, two things. One was, um, I think, isn't there also a, an issue of carbon monoxide being relatively a heavier gas um, than you see with, like, fire smoke? And so that smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors, I think the natural inclination, for instance, is to put the carbon monoxide detectors up high, um, and yet that's not necessarily where they should go, is my fuzzy recall. And this, so I wanted to ask if you could clarify that. And the second thing is, um, there was something in the horizon several years ago, I remember you and I talking about, about a finger, uh, like a pulse oximetry, but for, um, you know, yeah. carboxyhemoglobin. Yeah. And I just, but then I, and they were going to cost something, a few thousand dollars, and maybe there was some ERs were going to buy them. But I don't remember hearing the follow-up on that, so I wondered if you could, because I know now it's, I think it's still a blood test, so... No, uh, well, okay, so the, the, first, the, first, the first question being, um, that's, um, I'm trying to remember what's the expression we use. It's one of those sort of, you know, common lore that really has no basis for it. So, um, you know, it's, you know, it's a gas, it's going to circulate around. Um, you know, the stuff I've read is, you know, the most important thing is you have a detector and it's present. So if it's one that's integrated with a smoke alarm and it's up on the ceiling or it's a plug-in in the wall, you know, the important thing is to have it and have the places checked and the placement is not as big an issue as, as some have described. And I was actually reading 
a few months ago about a study that someone did of a chamber study to try to actually debunk this um, claim that it really matters what height you put at it, which you'll see in lots of places still. You know, if you do a Google search, you'll see things on it. So I don't think there's any real strong evidence for that. Um, my understanding is the um, not the pulse oximeters, but the carbon monoxide oximeters are used. Um, you know, they are, they're now apparently being used by uh, EMTs responding um, because we've had some question, interesting questions raised about is that reportable? So if I'm out there and I'm responding and I get a carboxyhemoglobin from my CO oximeter on someone, is that reportable to us? And now the patient refuses to go to the hospital <coughs> because they've had some oxygen, they're okay, they don't want to go, and we get no record now, right? There was a poisoning, there was a case, it's not reported to us because they never made it into the ED, et cetera. So that's an interesting question. So we know they're out there, we're being used in addition to the sort of handheld for measuring the concentration. And my understanding is there are EDs that are using them as well. Yeah. My understanding is that there are some that are out there. So it looks like a pulse oximetry. They look right, right, right. But they have, unlike the pulse oximetry, they the CO oximeters have the ability to really distinguish between carboxyhemoglobin, met hemoglobin, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. So quickly comment on I think wasn't there also an increase in cardiac and pulmonary uh, presentations during the ice storm, and that there is some issue of uh, the carbon monoxide sometime level sometimes yes. will trigger yes. somebody's existing yes. heart yes. disease or yep. existing yep. pulmonary yep. disease. Yep. Yep. So they may not present as CO poisoning per se, but they may present with their existing underlying chronic disease. Yep. Yep. And so actually those numbers, because sometimes people may look at them and think, well, gee, that's not that impressive, but actually that's just what we know and was detected. But there was a big surge. A, a yeah, surge yeah, in yeah. This is right. What I'm showing you is that which has been coded by the coder as being carbon monoxide poisoning related. And you're right. And I mentioned that as one of the sort of the symptoms is you can be presenting with, you know, cardiac related symptoms. And remember, it's carbon monoxide is going to bind to the myoglobin as well. So, and it's actually interesting that the mechanism by which carbon monoxide causes all the effects it occurs is still not all that well understood because hypoxia alone does not account for all those sort of health effects that are associated with it. So you've got it, you're affecting the electron transport system and energy production, you're affecting myoglobin, it then triggers a whole series of things within the brain and lipid peroxidation, et cetera. So the actual mechanisms by which carbon monoxide does all that it does is still not that well understood, um, other than clearly we understand the hypoxia. But from the reading I've done, that alone doesn't explain all the sort of symptoms that are and effects associated with carbon monoxide. Andy, I was really interested in um, the success of the law in getting carbon monoxide detectors in. As you know, it doesn't always happen that you pass a law and then actually something happens. Um, so <laughs> or that you bother to measure that. <laughs> yeah, right. Or that you bother to measure it. So, so I just wonder if you can talk the politics of it, who was supported, who didn't, and what the, it must have been some enforcement mechanism that you had in and sort of kind of how that whole thing uh -huh, worked and then uh -huh. how you got to measure it. Okay. So um, uh, let's see. The, it had an interesting history. Um, um, <laughs> But it was Senator Bill Diamond was the original real one who pushed the legislation. And I think it was uh, soon after, um, as it usually is the case, a couple of tragic incidences with some deaths. I'm trying to think of one of them may have been someone kind of living off grid or without power and using the generator as a supplemental source of power. Um, and there may have been another incident. So I think that was the initiating. Then, as you so often need in cases like this, it needed some strong advocates. It's a woman who lives in the Brunswick area whose sister tragically died. They had won a ski vacation in Colorado, and so she and her lovely family go out there and spend it. Um, there's no alarms in the condo they're staying in, and I think it was a gasoline a heater or something uh, was inventing, and the whole family died. And so this ma, this sister has made it her sort of cause of existence practically to really get involved. And she was a very elegant and forceful spokesperson in all the sessions and all the work sessions and the hearing, as well as some other people showed up. 
Um, and I think the um, chairs of the committee uh, at that time, Gostowski and Dora, helped me. Um, Gostowski, who was from Brunswick, yeah. so he was a, a senator for the woman, his sister. Yes, and, yes, and, yes. Uh, um, uh, a woman, and she is, I think, Portland. Um, She's still on the. She's still on the. They're both still on the committee, um, and I should know this, so I apologize for that. But both of them were strong proponents of the legislation. The administration was a strong proponent of the administration. The current administration supported um, some changes to the law that really made it clear that it applied to hotels, motels, and things like that. So, there it has actually enjoyed bipartisan support, which is. Fire departments were the fire departments were really key because if you think about fire department, firemen, fire yeah. people, they are in every single community, and they really the fire marshal was fabulous. Fire marshal was and the, the fire people and they tend, I mean, this is over generalizing. Maybe I'm shooting ahead of the camera, but I mean, I'm just <laughs> but I mean, fire people they tend to be a more conservative group, so that helped in terms of getting conservative legislators from rural areas who yeah. often are very libertarian in their stances on these kinds of things. Yeah. But when you have fire people who tend to be, as a, as a whole, in communities tend to be more conservative, promoting this, that was, it wasn't just us, you know, left-wing public health people. <laughs> so. Yeah, and actually it was interesting. It was, it was less us. I mean, we were there. We, we provided data. Um, to help them understand sort of the same sort of data I showed here. But it really was coming from those other forces. And as Dora said, the, the Fire Chiefs Association was very active on it and had a strong presence. MIOMA, the Maine Apartment Owners Management Association, they were there in sort of, if I recall, in a neither for nor against, but they weren't trying to kill the bill. They were there saying, give us time to implement this in a reasonable way. Um, and, and that's really a credit to them and their association. So it, it just, so first it had a lot of support. So the second part of the question, which was um, how did we measure it? Um, so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, the state has an ongoing random digit dial telephone survey that it does for all sorts of uh, behavioral risk factors. So it's called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. So we're making 4,000 random calls to people all over the state of the Maine every year um, and to ask a whole series of questions. And if you've got some money, you can pay to get some questions on it. So we had already started in 2004, that's why I happen to have the data, to just say, well, we need to understand what there is for detector prevalence. And then as soon as we knew the new law was being talked about, we said, let's run it for the next three years and see if we can see any evidence. On, and then we can tell the um, Department of Public Safety, hey, we will show whether or not your law is working, which they were thrilled about. And to the credit of the people who run our BRFSSS, they said, yes, you can run those questions. Give us your check. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and so we're fortunate that we've been able to measure and see this really, you know, again, to go from, you know, 20, 30 percent to 40, 50 in one year. Um, and th that's a year during which the law was implemented. So we're really excited to see what it will be next year. And then we're really excited to see if we see a reduction in morbidity and mortality. That's, that's the big thing. And that's what we're in. Have we what? In all my free time? Um, no, no. But we actually, we do have a draft paper of doing an analysis of uh, looking at the effect of detectors on morbidity. Uh, but I don't want to say what the results are yet. So. But that's in the works. So. One more question? Yep. I wondered if you'd seen any blips on uh, the statistics for this year with the possibility of more people using old wood stoves. Um, no, we have not seen anything unusual this year. We were worried about that. Um, but no, we have not. We were really worried about it uh, a couple years ago when uh, oil what, it was over four bucks a gallon, right? Um, um, we were really worried about what we would see then. Um, but I'm not sure that we've seen anything sort of unusual this year. Um, I think um, 
you know, one, one thing I will tell you is what we've found, and it's, you know, I've got to be patient. I know it's a new surveillance system, but um, the reporting is not good. So what we do is the reporting by hospital laboratories is great because it's automated. So if they get a carboxyhemoglobin above 5%, we get it. Now, the medical records people, that's been a bit of a struggle. So the reason why you see 2008 and 2009 data is because I don't want to show the 2010 and 11 because there's so much underreporting. So once we get access to the main health data organization data, which runs about two years behind, we run that against our case reports and say, what are we missing? And then we identify all the ones we're missing and we go to the hospital administrative offices and say, so, we see you had 30 things you coded as CO poisoning that were never reported to us. Can you pull all the medical files for those? Now, that allows us to classify them, but it's probably too far after to be able to do the case interviews and get all that valuable information. Um, so that's something we're working on. But once you start calling medical records folks and telling them we're checking on you, they start to pay attention. So our reporting has actually gone up in the past year, and um, we're hoping that will continue to improve. I guess there's one more is going to sneak in. I know the students have to get off. One last question. Do you know if uh, this past winter Connecticut had any peaks in CO? Uh, Connecticut had a big peak associated with uh, Tropical Storm Irene. Um, and it's interesting, you know, it's that we just see this every storm after. Um, but, uh, but Connecticut particularly had a big uh, spike in CO poisoning associated with Tropical Storm Irene. We had eight. I think they had over 100 cases, if I remember correctly. And so, yeah, so they're doing a study. We consulted with them because they're doing a study very much like the study we did back in 1999, 2000 when we did ours. But they had a big outbreak. Didn't hear as many in Vermont, uh, but they didn't have a system. Connecticut, like us, has a, uh, it's a notifiable disease. So that's how they knew that they were getting the cases. Dora. I'm just sorry, one more that just brought up. Um, so, you know, with a lot of new Americans in Portland and Lewiston, especially, who aren't speaking English, and, you know, I know that we discussed this over the years, but some, I, I'm just curious for an update on some of the challenges of trying to make sure that these messages are being. Are, are being able to be heard by them. Uh -huh. Because I remember there were some studies from Seattle when they had, um, I think it was some. It was a big winter storm. Big power winter storm in Seattle, and they had particularly a, a, a disproportionate number of immigrants right, who were right. affected by CO poisoning because they were using like hibachi grills or something yes, inside yes, to, yeah. to heat the home and weren't getting the messages because they were in English about what to do. Right, right. Yeah, so CDC makes a lot of different languages available with the core messages, and, and you're right that the other thing that's associated with those populations is the risk factors are different. And so a lot of it is the use of various sort of charcoal grilling type things within the home. They may have been in a much more airy home uh, from where they were from and thinking they could do that somewhat safely, and then they bring it into the tight homes of the U.S., and um, it's very dangerous. So, and there's been some really severe poisoning. So. If you look at the sort of the Tennessee uh, big ice storm and the Seattle big ice storms, they were much more sort of charcoal grill related being used indoors. If you look at upper New York's and Maine and Quebec's, um, they're all generator related um, in terms of what we've seen for poisonings. And now increasingly, if you're looking in the Gulf states, uh, with hurricanes, they're generator related, um, or, or more of a mix, but still a lot of generator related. But but CDC has made a bunch of different languages available uh, for those. So. I know we're out of questions, but I just wanted to: Are smokers more susceptible to monoxide Well, they're already going to be walking around with more carboxyhemoglobin than the average person, so I don't think that makes them any more or less susceptible. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know so. So the key message for them is stop smoking. So all right, great. Thank you. Thank you.